Thank you for joining us today for the second event of the Delta Dialogue series organized by the UKRI GCRF Living Deltas Hub. I'm Angelo Stelharis and I'm uh, from Durham University and I'll be moderating today's seminar together with my colleague Siobhan Warrington from Newcastle University. The Delta Dialogue series aims to promote interdisciplinary and international dialogue on crucial sustainability challenges affecting the world's deltas. We try to build knowledge and networks by bringing together speakers from different sectors and contexts to share their expertise and to reflect upon the complex socio-ecological challenges facing deltas today. Our goal is to strengthen, uh, strengthen partnerships in delta research, governance and policy at a regional and global scale. Before introducing today's dialogue and, and also our guest speakers, uh, go through some housekeeping rules and information for uh, for our audience. The webinar will be recorded, it's being recorded as you can see right now, and it might, it might be used on our website or in a separate U YouTube channel, and also sent to any registered attendees. Please remain on mute unless asking a question or partaking in the panel discussion. If you have questions, please type them within the chat and they will be answered at the end of the seminar. I will be collecting them in the end and you'll have a chance to uh, get a response from our speakers. Each speaker will give a seven minute presentation. The presentations will be followed by a round table discussion but moderated by Siobhan Warrington with the final 15 minutes being for a, a Q and A with the audience. Today's event uh, looks at collaboration and co-production with Delta communities in India, Bangladesh, Myanmar and Vietnam, as well as the challenges and opportunities in working towards meaningful partnerships. Our four speakers are Sojan Bright, Abdul Mobin Ibn Haviz, Dr. Anandita Saha, and Dr. Nad uh, Dao. I will present each speaker separately, and after the present, uh, after this short introduction, they will be given a seven minute presentation on their own research as it is related to today's topic. Uh, so John Bright is a scholar activist and a member of the current people from Burma, where he serves as the head of water governance program with the current environmental and social action network. His research and policy advocacy works focus on fostering inclusive, informed, accountable and equitable community based natural resource governance in the conflict areas of current state Burma. He holds an MA in Sustainable De International Development from Brandeis University, and he's currently pursuing a PhD from wait, waging, I'm not sure about the pronunciation, sorry for that, uh, Wageningen University in the Netherlands. So, so John, if you'd like to share your screen and begin your presentation. Thank you so much, Angelos. Um, now I'm going to share my screen here. Can you all see my screen? Okay, great. So um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, my name is John. And today I'd like to um, discuss about the Saloon Peace Park, a case study that I'm going to talk about collaboration and co-production with the communities in the Saloon River. Um, so just to give a little bit of background, is that um Saluin is a is an international river. It flows from China, China, and then uh, Thailand, and then Burma in Myanmar. So, uh, it's a it's a historical and political river for uh, people uh, across the Saluin River community, especially in our country, uh, because uh, it's in the border region. It has a lot of uh, historical political evidence. Uh, uh, across Burma's Myanmar history, and also it's a source of culture and uh, kind of spiritual. It's a culture and spiritual river for the local community, and it's also a source of livelihood for millions of people uh, along the river. So today we are going to talk about uh, uh, one of the case study in the Southern River. <laughs> uh, so 
one of the issue for the river is dam projects. So these dam projects will be, uh, uh, it's planned by uh, Chinese government and Thailand government and, and um, Burmese government, Myanmar government. Uh, and they plan a series of dams in the river and it's challenging a lot of uh, uh, environmental, social, culture, and uh, um, you know, historical, all these uh, threats uh, to the local community. And all the benefit will be uh, controlled. All these, uh, the kind of the river will be controlled by the uh, military authorities in, in Burma. And uh, because, uh, the, you know, the Burmese military wanted to control over the area here, there are a lot of violence, conflict, uh, many displacement, human rights violation, all these things are still happening in the region. Uh, another problem is that uh, we still have, uh, you know, the connection between human and non-human aspect is not fully appreciated. Uh, currently in our uh, research, advocacy, and also uh, like um, in, in, in the advocacy activities that we are uh, even doing, like in, in a lot of uh, our NGOs and, uh, um, you know, international communities, uh, because, you know, um, the river is viewed as a entity, as a, as a goods to produce electricity, to produce, uh, to like, uh, to have a economic benefit only. But for the local community, they have cultural, historical, and spiritual relationships. These are not fully recognized yet. So, uh, because you know, in our in our in that community, you know, community we have like a, a spiritual beings in the Karen community. This is the community of Karen people. So, for example, like if you if they wanted to do something uh, like agriculture, they have to. They have to uh, provide, you know, spiritual offering to the. Uh, they call it chikasa, uh, gogasa. Gogasa means the the, the uh, guardians of the lands. So they have these kind of uh, spiritual kind of ceremonies and events that they need to practice before doing agriculture and any kind of activities on the land and forest. And also the same with uh, the same with uh, water as well. They have chikasa. So they have to perform these uh, spiritual activities. And this needs to be uh, recognized. And uh, like this is a map of uh, how they uh, kind of manage, you know, the resources. For example, there are uh, scared groves in the village, you know, that, uh, you know, are protective, you know, all these kind of uh, community-based uh, mapping show that uh, this is really like a traditional and customary uh, system uh, meant of managing, you know, forest and uh, re natural resources in the area. So I'm just going to uh, run quickly on these things. And this is like an example of uh, uh, how, you know, local community perform the fish conservation, you know, traditional. You know, there, there is a certain species of uh, uh, fish that they don't uh, touch because it's kind of like a, a, a the king of fish, uh, you know, in the area. So uh, this is also important for them. And this is like a diagram of how they, uh, <clears throat> they how they manage, you know, like a local council to manage uh, resources, land, and water. So they how they coordinate. <clears throat> so what we do is we try to bring all these aspects together. Uh, and then uh, this is a map of like a uh, Selwyn Peace Park. It's it's a uh, 1.36 million acre. It hosts 70,000 people, local community. And we are trying to, the, the vision is to foster peace, cooperation, cultural resilience, sustainable uh, resource management, uh, biocultural conservation and local livelihood improvement based on three objectives. One is peace and self-determination. The second is environmental integrity. And the third one is cultural survival. So this is the map. Uh, this is a map of how it looks like. You know, the, the yellow co color is the majority. It, it's it's a, a customary territory. You know, they have like a, a agriculture activities, 
you know, forest activity and those culture uh, related, spiritual related activities conducted in those area. And you, you might see some other area like a green area. These are community forests and also reserve forests in the area. So this area, it's not controlled by the, uh, the government, <laughs> the military uh, authority. This is the uh, uh, autonomous area in the current territory. So it has a long political is history. That's, that's why I mentioned the river is very political. <clears throat> and, and this is how we govern you know, the, the park. You know? uh, we have the Southern Peace Park General Assembly where you know, community members have a representation to make decision in that area. And uh, there are also local authority, the current local authority uh, involved in the in the assembly to make decision together also from the representative of civil society organizations to um, contribute to assist in technical and research and all these things so this is a kind of cooperation like we mentioned here cooperation and co-production and trying to uh, trying to institutionalize uh, institutionalize these uh, local traditional knowledge and culture belief system into this kind of like a uh, uh, so that it will become sustainable and then uh, local people have a, a voice and have a, you know uh, seats in decision making kind of table so this is idea so i just wanted to give a sense of like this is how we conducted our livelihood activity there are a lot of projects you know in that area and this is community-based uh, participatory you know forest patrol activity this is our women group research uh, and this is our livelihood support program during uh, uh, pandemic. These activities were very helpful. Uh, this is our work with next generation because uh, indigenous knowledge, we pass down the knowledge uh, through uh, from elders to next generation. This is very important. Uh, and also this is, these are our orchid research. Uh, these are our biodiversity, you know, um, there are still a lot of uh, species in that area. Uh, these are our fish uh, conservation areas. And also this is our, uh, our green energy initiative, you know, local based, you know, micro hydro power kind of projects because we, we, we you know, people want electricity, uh, but they can, you know, they, they don't need those kind of large dam that is, very politically sensitive and environmentally socially damageable. Uh, so, you know, we want to create these uh, kind of energy, we call it energy democracy, energy projects that is controlled and managed by community. So this is a kind of idea that we are trying to develop in this area. So the, the, uh, to try to rub out this, a local understanding of uh, the river is key, in, uh, you know, in uh, keeping the river flow fleary, and then uh, trying to uh, keep it sustainable. So it's very important to see the rivers through the local and indigenous eyes and recognize human and more than human aspects, uh, the indigenous ontology, you know, and also help people who are still displaced in the area because of all these violence and conflict and strengthen, you know, this kind of grassroots democracy that they are trying to develop, you know, trying to strengthen the local institutions. So this kind of, uh, this, uh, Southern Peace Park project demonstrate that community-led governance support both protection of nature and the resilience of communities in the face of global climate uh, emergency. So thank you so much. Uh, I hope we have more discussion and question and answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Son John, for the presentation. Um, the next speaker, first of all, uh, uh, I would like to ask the audience to um, write any questions in the chat. We'll be collecting them later. So the, the, the second speaker today is Abdul Mobin Ibn Hafiz, a research assistant for the Institute of Water and Flood Management at Paklantes University of Engineering and Technology. Um, he's, uh, he has a Bachelor in Science in Civil Engineer and is looking to pursue higher studies in the future. His research interests include water quality and wastewater treatment. As part of his involvement with the Living Deltas Hub, Mobin has been working on a collaborative research initiative with two communities in Hulna, district of the Bangladesh Sudurbans. Uh, Mobin, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Angelos. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Abdul Mubin, a BSc graduate from Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to give me this opportunity to share the uh, stage with such a diverse and experienced group of researchers. I am humbled and honored. Uh, today, I am going to uh, share you some insights from research uh, I have been engaged with as a researcher with the Living Delta Hub. Oh. Uh, sorry, uh, I have some problem with my presentation. Uh, can you uh, see my screen now? Hello? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay, sorry. I had some problem with the screen sharing. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like uh, uh, today I'm going to share uh, with you some insights from research I have been engaged with as a researcher with the Living Delta Sub. Uh, I have been working alongside a team of researchers in Bangladesh and the UK and uh, with two communities in the Shundarbans on a piece of intergenerational research. Uh, in this slide, uh, you can uh, see the location of the two communities that were chosen as our study area. Uh, Horinkola and Ghatakhali villages are part of uh, Koira Union, uh, Khulna district. These villages are positioned close to the Shundarbans uh, Reserve Forest, an area of mangrove forest, waterways, and island that spans across the GBM Delta of India and Bangladesh. The research aims to listen to and learn from older and younger women and men about their experiences of environmental change. We are also interested in understanding their relationship with the environment uh, through both their livelihoods, but also in terms of heritage, well-being, and leisure, and also how they feel about the future. In these two villages, people live with multiple threats to their homes and livelihoods, in particular, uh, uh, riverbank erosion, increasing uh, um, a salinity of soil and water, and an increase in the frequency and intensity of cyclones. A group of young Bangladeshi uh, researchers, including myself, visited the two villages three times between December 2021 and uh, May uh, 2022, and used a range of methods, including oral history, participatory mapping, and we worked across the two villages as two groups, a group of four female researchers engaging with younger and older women, and a group of four male researchers engaging with younger and older men. The Bangladeshi researchers include early career researchers like myself, master's students, NGO workers, and uh, young people from the community. Uh, in this slide, a brief description of the data that has been collected over the three field visits are presented. Uh, you can see uh, the, uh, that we have uh, collected 43 history interviews. Uh, all of them are translated. We have prepared eight maps for reports of focus group discussions from women and men in each village. Uh, and we have also collected some additional data. The choice of methods and careful documentation have resulted in a large archive of first-hand accounts and community-generated knowledge. This will uh, support our efforts to ensure the voices, experiences, and knowledge of women and men living in Delta regions are central to the communications and impact work of the Living Deltas Hub as a whole. Uh, now I'll be talking about our research methods and challenges that arrived with them uh, and how people responded and how we overcome those challenges. Oral history interview enabled us to learn from the people on a more uh, uh, personal level about the environmental changes that have happened in their communities and the way these challenges affected their lives. The most challenging part of this method was to make people comfortable so that they can talk and make them realize that we wanted to hear uh, what they had to say and learn from them. To ensure this, we gave them uh, time and let them talk freely instead of directing the conversation with fixed and rigid questions. We were very attentive to uh, what they were saying and it gave them a feeling of importance. Uh, Follow-up questions were also asked to move the conversation forward. This helped them to get rid of the initial hesitation and they opened up and got engaged in the interview. The mapping session was particularly difficult uh, as the people are not habituated to working with pens and pencils to draw a map. It took them some time to comprehend what was asked of them. Uh, so at first we had to draw a little according to their directions to create the map. Eventually they understood the task and got uh, caught up on gear. 
uh, with time as their village got visible on a piece of paper, they got excited uh, and motivated. And when the map was completed, they were proud of the uh, outcome. Now I will discuss the learnings uh, uh, from this uh, field visit. Uh, we learned that uh, we learned from people how the environment of the localities changed over the time span of, uh, of 30 to 40 years. Uh, loss of island, uh, loss of land property of the villages. Uh, we learned uh, that uh, almost around uh, 20, uh, 2,000 to 300 acres of land were uh, lost uh, due to embankment breaching and how these changes affected people's life and livelihood. Uh, for example, people in these regions uh, were, uh, at, uh, were associated with uh, agriculture, uh, but uh, due to the uh, change in environment, they got, uh, uh, they got more engaged in fish farming and sh uh, shrimp farming. Uh, and it also got resulted in extinction of traditional occupations, like uh, people uh, in the past were uh, engaged in uh, Bawali and Maoli activities, that means collecting honey and uh, uh, wood from the forest. But all these occupations have lost now because uh, people cannot uh, do these activities as uh, many trees, trees species has uh, been extinct. And uh, we also learned about their survival tactics and coping mechanism during cyclones, how they lead their life in the, uh, um, how they lead their life in the cyclone shelter and how uh, how much uh, uh, relief and help they receive from the local NGOs and how uh, does this affect their lives and their, also their hopes and expectations about the uh, future. Okay, and finally, I will discuss uh, about the broader reflections. Uh, working effectively with people to support and encourage them to express their knowledge, experience, and feelings takes time. So far, we have visited the same communities three times and uh, each visitor uh, present for three or four days. We had sufficient time to take our time as researchers to arrange activities at times and in places which are convenient to research participants. We didn't have to rush people and we could also respect their existing commitment. Uh, the group researchers included uh, NGO workers familiar with the communities, community members themselves, young scholars from Kuwait and graduate students from nearby Kulna universities. Multiple researchers, male and female, enabled us to engage with younger and older women and men with different methods, which we believe encourage uh, engagement and participation. All but one of these researchers were under 25, uh, while the older member of the team was uh, invaluable in terms of communication with authorities. The presence of younger researchers supported our work. Younger researchers could easily engage and connect with young uh, research participants and older research participants adopted a personalistic role to share their knowledge uh, with the young researchers and also keen to support their research activities. Uh, during the initial area, a male and female community researcher was recruited. At the beginning of the first research visit to the communities, the other researchers ran a session to introduce the research and methods to the community researchers. Uh, the community researchers played a vital role as a bridge between the community and uh, us, the researchers. It helped us to manage local participants. Uh, they made all the necessary arrangements for the research work. And most importantly, due to the community researchers, we got a quick acceptance in the community and it helped us to build a better bonding with the local people. They also provided us with necessary information after the visit, so keeping in touch with them has been really helpful. Uh, we have always uh, uh, provided uh, open-end approaches uh, to provide a space for community priorities to emerge. Uh, we wanted to learn from the people uh, about what they had to say and uh, we didn't impose uh, any of our findings and uh, desires or requirements uh, on the community. And we use the third visit as an opportunity to further uh, sense checking with community members, running a series of more structured focus group discussions with photographs as prompts, uh, which serve to generate a discussion around some of the key themes to emerge from the research activities conducted during the first and second visit. During the third visit, we also engaged research parties in a discussion about how they felt the data generated should be communicated to others. We wanted to know from them how best to communicate the data and to whom, which is something that we'll be working on over the next six months. We are committed to ensuring uh, uh, the 
data in a way that is meaningful to the research participants and the wider communities, but that we also communicate it uh, to decision makers, both government and non-government. We hope that we can find ways to involve the community researchers and any other research participants in those activities. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mobin. Um, so the next speaker is Dr. Anandita Saha, uh, who is a museologist and conservator working as a senior research associate at the Center for World Environmental History, uh, Department of Sa uh, History Department of Sussex University under the Mangrove School Project. She's currently a guest faculty in the Ancient India and World History Department of the Sanskrit College and University, West Bengal, India. For the last six years, her uh, area of research has focused on the impact of climate change uh, on geographically vulnerable regions of Western Bengal, exploring the uncertainties of Deltai communities, their resilience and desire for transformation. Anandita, you may start. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I am Anandita from India. Uh, today, I am going to share the tale of uncertainties of the Sundarbans children and how they are imagining a safer future. We found that the youth of the Sundarban have a demand a change in their identity after witnessing their parents' hardship for earning bread and butter. So we think that the co-literacy co-production of knowledge is essential to empower these children. This is the basis of our innovative Bangladesh project. Our project has two objectives. The first one is to capture the unheard voice of these children uh, regarding uncertainty and climate change, and also to pro co produce knowledge with the help of the media. We have adopted uh, bottom up approaches to document the voice of the school children through oral reading and painting narratives. We have organized two introductory engagement sessions at Ultoli and uh, Raidiki Islands of the Sundarbans. And, uh, the first session was organized virtually because of COVID pandemic, and the second was organized in person. We have engaged local facilitators for these uh, sessions. Uh, 65 students from two vernacular co-education schools participated in this program. And their age range between 12 to 18 years, years. We have selected them randomly, keeping in mind gender equality. Uh, now I am showing some outputs of the uh, engagement session. Uh, children has made uh, children have made several paintings and also three tapestries, uh, which highlights the past, present, and uh, future in the advance. Uh, this step is to highlight the past Sundarban, uh, where uh, we can see the sylvan beauty of the Sundarban and their primary livelihoods are secure, their religion, culture uh, in full bloom. And the children heard about the past Sundarban from their parents and grandparents. This is the grim reality of the present day Sundarban, where one can see the gloomy sky, barren land, killing of animals. Uh, the second painting highlights the uh, effect of uh, climatic vulnerability like flood cyclone. And in the third painting, uh, we can see the noose hung to a pickaxe, symbolizing the faith of downcast farmers, unfruitful return of the migrant levels. Overall, the image shows deforestation, the wrath of climate, the hopeless present and uncertain future. This is the representation of future Sundarban. The, uh, this image voices the desire of you to live in a safe and habitable environment. Here, uh, children want to preserve the biodiversity of the Sundarban. At the same time, they want to implement certain technologies like turbine to convert uh, tidal energy into electric energy, solar panels, etc., to make their life a little smooth. The second painting actually looks like the town-like appearance. Uh, here, uh, they actually want to keep uh, asking about improvement of uh, the transportation system, education system, health system in the Sundarbans. In the third painting, uh, we can find uh, that uh, they want to adopt 
various uh, jobs like uh, teacher, doctor, uh, artist, but they don't want to adopt their parents' occupation. We have also organized an exhibition locally at Kultori uh, with these uh, outputs. And we have also invited uh, community people, local stakeholders to see the exhibitions. And the local stakeholder referred to these children as nothing less than uh, artists. These are some panels of the exhibition. Here, uh, children are explaining their visual representation to the stakeholders. These are the images of a uh, round table discussion, uh, students, community people, uh, scientists, environmentalists, wildlife photographer, NGO people, local policy makers participated in this uh, uh, round table session. And uh, children asked uh, various uh, questions uh, regarding uh, local issue. And also uh, the local policy makers uh, have assured them that they would help them amplify their unheard voice to the higher community of the state, higher authority of the state. And they also suggested providing training to these students toward the development of their artistic and creative skills. And on the basis of their suggestion, we have also conducted a two training program at Kuntoli and uh, Raidiki on batik block printing, uh, printing and tie and dye work. 40 students uh, participated in these uh, training workshops. These are some final outputs of the Batik workshop where we can uh, see the uncertain life and livelihoods of the Sundarbans community. Here, biodiversity of the Sundarbans uh, is also affected. Here, the fishermen often fell, uh, fall prey in the hand of voracious tiger during fish collection. Uh, mother at is crying uh, to see the uh, uncertainties of her creature. Here, uh, the uh, children suggest uh, the usefulness of floating vegetable garden. Here, the youth uh, is asking for conducting training workshop on making jam, jelly, pickle, using locally available fruit and vegetable and involvement of female group in this program. As uh, domesticated animals and their products are the only source of earning immediately after any natural disasters. Uh, so training can be provided on uh, poultry farming or goat farming uh, as an alternative livelihood. They also ask for revival of certain uh, traditional craft form like uh, basket making, uh, fish trap making, using uh, bamboo strips. As the community people of the Sundarban are the main victim of the climatic disaster, so their voice should be addressed during uh, regional policy making, which is clearly reflected in this image. These are some output uh, of the Badri workshop. These are some final output of the blog printing workshop. Now, what I understand from this research work that the children of the Sundarban are now accustomed with the climate vulnerability as they have been seen with, uh, have been witnessing this kind of environmental crisis since their livelihood, a sign of childhood. And only the frequency of the climate vulnerability increased with. Also the youth uh, are asking for a concrete embankment and plantation of mangrove that can solely save the people of the Sundarban from frequent flood and cyclone. They are also quite anxious regarding the existence of certain vulnerable islands of the uh, uh, vulnerable low lying island of the Sundarban as the sea level is rising in an alarming rate. Increasing salinity in soil as well as water body have also threatened the primary livelihoods of the Sundarban's community. So they are forced to adopt uh, work as a wage laborer. Uh, besides, COVID pandemic has severely affected their primary livelihood. Uh, the children are also eager to preserve the biodiversity as well as uh, cultural diversity of the Sundarban. At the same time, they want to preserve the indigenous law and knowledge for the posterity. 
Children also raise questions regarding tourism industry of the Sundarbans as tourists are polluting the natural environment of the Sundarbans by depleting waste here and there. Now we can conclude that the children have seen their hardships of their parents and predecessors, and they want to deviate from their primary occupation as these are threatened to lose value and therefore they want to secure their livelihoods by entering different occupations using their knowledge and skills. Since they have good artistic talent, given proper training in this aspect, they can grow into related jobs and works which will help put food on their tables. It is clear from the untold stories of these school children that the anxieties, uncertainties regarding climatic vulnerability cannot overthrow the resilience for reimagining a better future. I would like to stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anindita. It was uh, very interesting to see. I personally had the chance to see most of the tapestries in at Sussex University in July, and I can say that uh, it's impossible for any picture to make justice. So the next uh, the next speaker today is uh, uh, Na. Um, uh, Na is uh, Dr. Na Dao is assistant professor in the Department of Social Science at York University in Toronto, Canada. She holds a PhD in geography from York University and has conducted research on topics including development induced displacement in Southeast Asia, gender equality, and women's role in water resource governance, agribusiness, mining, and land grabbing. Na is now focusing on river ecologies, gender, and youth roles in livelihood changes in the Mekong and Red River deltas, exploring how the delta landscape has been transformed through expansion of. Uh, boom crops, industrialization, resorts, land and water degradation, and migration. Um, now the floor is yours. The, we had some issues with the PowerPoint. You probably have fixed it by now. So thank you very much. Thank you, Angelos. Um, I'm so sorry. Uh, something wrong with my computer today, and it didn't let me to share the screen. It's a, I try to share it, and it's you know, different blocks and it's nothing show up. So uh, I'm so sorry. Um, okay, so um, what I wanted to, um, good morning, everyone. I wanted to share uh, with you today is that our research um, in the Mekong Delta is working on impact of uh, coal fire, hydro, uh, coal fire power in, in a coastal area of, of the Mekong Delta. And we used, um, sorry, I just like no map to share, but it's, uh, so we use photo voice as a key methodology to work with the communities. And the further projects, so, uh, we have two key um, objectives of the project. First, we study the socio-ecological changes caused by coal fire thermal plants in the Mekong Delta. And second, we try to, um, empower women and young people in environmental protections and raise their voice in um, um, to policy makers um, in terms of things that change, uh, cause change in their life. Um, so the reasons that we choose photo voice because we think that it's important, for, you know, taking photos, everyone um, have interest and people uh, feel like it's, it's exciting to take photo about daily uh, life um, that's something happened in their lives and the photo voice um, just a couple of um, things about the methodologies it's a process um, we call the creative and participatory uh, way of doing um, research and the aim is to bring uh, the voice of local community members to wider audience through uh, their photos uh, taken by themselves uh, when we see villagers taking a leading role in documenting and mapping the socio um, and ecological uh, chains um, in the in, in the area. Um, the researcher, we came in the, the village, um, you're working at a group of um, villagers who excited who excited about you know documenting their, their livelihood chains and environment and chains, uh, work together in terms of training people how to take photos. Um, uh, why they take that photos, 
uh, and talk about the photos that you know they take. And they uh, take a leading role in terms of choosing what they want to take, you know, what kind of photo they want to take, how they want to collect data, um, and everything that related to what they do every day, like uh, in terms of egg, growing crop, in work in the field, fishing, so land chains, you know, water chains, uh, and their adaptation to to chains. Um, so um, we we come in with a training, like we gave the uh, villagers uh, cameras so they can work on. We also try to, you know, train them in in terms of the technique, how to make photos, uh, choose focus, um, and tell about talk about their their story. So different group of people they can work in pair or in a group um, of threes or four practicing the photos and share uh, what they think about their photos. And um, that's, you know, the first step. And that's the second, we um, work together in a group. Uh, so everyone um, try to, you know, uh, explain about the photo, how they relate to their life to the photo. Um, and uh, all, connecting all these photos, putting them into theme. And the villagers actually take the active role, leading role in how to how to decide what theme um, those photos belong to. And from there, we work in, you know, kind of design different emerging theme that they work on. Like, um, uh, it depends like livelihoods or waters or land or pollutions. Uh, so in um, the area that we work on, it's in Chaving province of the Mekong Delta West. We have the um, thermal, um core thermal power plant there um, and the villagers documenting how um the operations of the of the plan um change the way they they interact with the environment and do their livelihood for example um i'm so sorry there's no um i can't share you the photo but it just um it's you can see uh you can see the the way they talk about how um they have to change the crop. For example, uh, taking um, photos of the vegetable um, field and they explain about how um, the dust from the coal fire plants causing um, a problem with the plants or other photo, uh, how they related the, to the life before and the life now. The same for, for example, sun making. The photos show that in the past, uh, the area of the, the sun um was larger like much larger and how the, the well, how much income they could gain from those um activities uh but now how things change because of this um the dust causing um the sun to become darkened right uh it was not as white as before and they couldn't sell it with high uh, you know the um the high price as other area people sell it so um are also, um, for example, they took photo of the river, uh, explain how the river was in the past and how it changed now. Uh, so, so everything uh, we see, like um, we we try to do that. Um, villagers work on um, the daily chains, and they can, um, you know, that help them, you know, to talk about what's really uh, happening and um, how they should. Um, react or respond to those chains. Who they talk about, you know, uh, how to make things better, how to uh, in um, talk to or negotiate with decision maker. Um, and at the end, they um, organize a small exhibition in the village uh, to invite um, um, of the authority to come and also representative from the the factories, um, the plant, the power plant to come to share. Um, you know what they think and and mix their request and so um you know uh, that all those small thing at the end people feel more confident and um uh, they can freely talk about uh, what's going on um and um so that's that have in in a way that they you know they share their concerns um and the desire for better futures um and the challenge uh, working on uh, with these um method is that uh, 
in the past, people just take photo without thinking, you know, they just, oh, that's nice. Or they want to just take photo. But now they take photos with an aim, right? They think about what they want to tell, what story behind the photo. Um, and and um, so, but it, it, it took a while for them to learn how to work on that. And also a certain thing um, that can be a sensitive topic that people would, reluctant to to talk about but when they take a photo um it actually um it have but it's uh but it's at the you know at the end it's just um how to say it's a certain thing that challenge for for people um because of the topic that they they talk about but um but we think that it's the benefit is a lot bigger when you can um bring art into um uh, how to say a convincing a policy maker and um and and um developer about um the project that they work on and um how it impacts people's life and what people would like to to have right you know in terms of support for their life um so i think that um basically um what I um, would like to share, I'm so sorry again for, um, you know, like not able to share the photos, all the photos, people working on their projects and, and you know, what we, we have at the end. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Na. And I'm sorry you faced some technical difficulties, but I've mentioned to everybody, we'll find a way to share those slides with <clears throat> everyone who's here today. Um, and you spoke so passionately about it, it was <laughs> it was still very engaging. So thank you. So thank you to all four speakers for sharing their work and their ideas with us today. And we'll now move on to a short roundtable discussion with those speakers so that we can further discuss some of the issues raised. Um, and just to kind of briefly say that, um, you know, in terms of what, in terms of some of the key things that came out across the four presentations, I really appreciated John's um, kind of highlighting this importance of self-determination, which I think is key and came across the other presentations as well. We heard about the careful choice of methods to support expression and to build confidence, the importance of making space for local understandings, the time and the relationships, the researcher relationships that are required to support listening to people. Um, and in relation to self-determination, several, several of the presentations talked about finding ways to support people to imagine better and more resilient futures um, and to find ways to support people to communicate their concerns and at times directly. Um, so I'd like, to, I'd like to ask all four speakers if they could turn their cameras on um, so we can see the four speakers. And um, if I'd like to ask each of you to very briefly sum up for me what you think are the key benefits of a research approach that involves collaboration or co-production with Delta communities. Um, so yeah, thinking about the key benefits of a research approach that engages more meaningfully or purposefully with um, Delta dwellers in the research process. John, could I start with you? Uh, yes, thank you so much. I was trying to unmute myself. <laughs> um, yeah, the benefit for research approach that involve collaboration, it's um, it's definitely community members have ownership, and you know, um, you know they have a chance to lead the initiative, and also like in 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 my case, like recognition of indigenous knowledge is um is very important so when we collaborate together we try to do uh you know this together it's it's already you know a recognition uh in the process so um this is very important and also um like uh adapt adaptation of local situation is very important in 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 conflict sensitive setting as well, like in my situation, you know, we are working in a very like uh, conflict sensitive uh, area uh, because of all these military, uh, you know, uh, operation and human right violation, all these things. So do no harm is very important. Uh, so when we collaborate, we work together, 
we are aware of this situation and we can you know avoid this situation and also based on these uh kind of uh, understanding we plan together we work together and um yeah and uh, this is all about community based resource governance uh, i mean in overall benefits so yeah i think that uh, i would say thank you thank you john and uh, now uh, anandita do you have anything to add to that anything different additional uh yeah well i i would echo john i just like um i feel like uh the the method that we use it's really about the ownership of the knowledge i mean it's we talk about like co creating knowledge for impact but it's really about you know the the, the villagers because it's the, for example for me the photos that was taken by 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 the villagers so they they was very proud of themselves like they they was like happy and excited that they was able to take those photos and those photos was printed out and many of them actually at the end they 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 framed those photos they put it at their home so they, you know, they, they love it and they, they feel like it's something they could do to contribute to, you know, the knowledge productions, right? The, and also the way to, uh, you know, spread like their knowledge to to wider audience, their issue to wider audience. And that that's, you know, and I think that's, that's a wonderful thing that, um, and we really appreciate the time that they spend with us. Um, spending that because uh, all new and exciting for 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 us everyone yeah thank you M Mobin do you have anything to add in terms of the benefits of this approach from your experience uh, well uh, what I found uh, beneficial is uh, we learn from people uh, what actually affects them and what uh, are the possible solutions they think Think about the problems, and if we uh, don't take uh, those uh, things and their perspective into account, it actually uh, leaves a large hole in the whole uh, system. Uh, gap uh, remains uh, in the uh, whole uh, trying to find proper solutions of the problem. So I found that uh, actually uh, contact uh, 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 engaging with the uh, local community uh, helps to find uh, better and appropriate solutions that are actually. Uh, uh, beneficial to them. Uh, like, for example, uh, people uh, in uh, uh, Horinkola and Ghatakali uh, villages both uh, mentioned uh, uh, solutions to the embankment reaching problem they find uh, better to solve the uh, problem. And uh, that, were, that was totally different from the approach the authority uh, was uh, authority took. And so uh, I found that uh, like engaging with the community will actually always help us to find uh, better solutions to the local problems. Thank you. And then teacher, I wonder if I could ask you to talk a little bit about what collaboration and co-production looks like across the whole research journey. Because I think you hinted at that, you showed us part that happening within your presentation about using the art, <clears throat> the art and the outputs made by young people in um, discussions with um, authorities, policymakers, etc. But yeah, I think sometimes we can talk a lot about the methods, but we forget that if we're talking about genuine collaboration and co-production, we should think about how that happens across the research journey. Actually, uh, this is the first time I think that the children's voice uh, is addressed. Uh, and uh, at the they have, uh, I think they have immense knowledge regarding their local flora fauna. Uh, they uh, have uh, knowledge about medicinal plants, local plants. They know the usefulness of these plants also. And also uh, they actually, when uh, during will visit, I have uh, noticed that uh, they actually uh, told me that some species are disappearing from the environment. So they observe these but uh, they don't get any platform to tell this. So this kind of uh, co-production is helpful, actually uh, open their eyes. And also uh, this training workshop helped them to uh, the alternative livelihood also. Mm. Yeah, no, that was a very interesting part of your presentation to understand that the research methods themselves had had a kind of a tangible benefit for those research participants um, in terms of skills development? Uh, we need to develop skills uh, 
we need to revise our traditional skills, also develop new skills to uh, for uh, their alternative life because they want to uh, deviate from their primary life. They want to uh, live in a secure, actually, environment, and not only environment, uh, secure life, live in a secure life. Um, no, can I ask you a little bit about okay. this question about? Sorry, okay. sorry, Anandita. Just repeat that question. Either Na or Anandita about the different ways that we can support good collaboration across the research journey, whether that's setting the research agenda or in the communication of the knowledge generated and looking towards impact. So what we what we do beyond methods when we talk about good collaboration. Now, actually, I can hear you. Here, uh, clearly, sometimes it drop sound is dropping your sound. Okay, sorry, Anandita. Now, would you like to answer that? Now it's clear, but uh, I can't hear your question. Angelos, could you put my question Hello. in the chat? Hello, Anandita. We'll put the question in the chat. Now, could you answer while well, Anandita? Okay. I mean, um, I think beside uh, method, obviously, um, um, it's it's um, it's all from the um, beside method. I think it's all from the the bit like core design research from the beginning. Like before we started to doing things, we need to to be in the community, communicate with people, uh, understand each other, like, you know, build trust and relation, like connection, relationship with the community. Um, and then we we work from there together. So we're not, I think the key important thing is that we don't impose our idea from outside uh, to, to the people. And we sat, we, you know, set a longer path for the, for the research, the impact like again like you know what i mentioned before like we call aim at like call creating knowledge for impact so you know we just everything we need to to set out from the beginning um, uh, like how we want to do it like what the purpose of it and the relationship that we have with the communities and i think that that's important thing because it's it might take a while it depends on who you know which community you work with, what kind of topic, because it's sometimes you know if a topic it's too sensitive or difficult to work on, it needs more, a lot more time become you know before you talk about method with villagers. Um, that that's from my experience. Thank you, Na. Um, Angelos, I'm conscious of the time, and I can see that there's a few questions in the chat. Uh, we have um, like a question from Andy and three interrelated questions from uh, Adrian. So I guess like two questions. I think we have like, another five minutes, I would say, for uh, the group discussion. So we can, and uh, before we go to the Q&A. Okay, so I think then um, I would just like to ask um, a, a critical question, which I think is important is, whether there are ever any disadvantages for communities that we seek to engage in our work, what we need to be aware of as researchers, we shouldn't assume it's always a good thing for every community to be involved. There may be difficulties or challenges for different community members to engage in our work. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that in terms of your experience or ideas, if there are times where it may not be appropriate to seek to collaborate closely with communities or to be additionally careful about that. Um, John, do you want to? Um, it's, a, it's a very good question. <laughs> and, uh, and also practical question, I would say. This is um, um, ha happening, I mean, in reality. Um, because uh, as we mentioned, uh, understanding local um, indigenous um, um, ontology is very, very important uh, because sometimes, um, you know, researcher might not fully aware of uh, the indigenous uh, ontology. 
for example, like look uh, um, the researcher might come with a uh, 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 knowledge that is uh, understanding the river as economic you know benefit and all these things, and then asking the wrong question, it's 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 a uh, it's a very uh, different direction you know <laughs> of a researcher and a community member. So I think in this case, uh, it would be um, better if we, uh, you know, work together, not just, you know, like um, researcher coming down and then ask question, but rather than, you know, doing those kind of like uh, one way uh, communication, but then um, I, I have uh, uh, many friends uh, who, come to visit the local, uh, the Saloon Peace Park uh, community, uh, you know, spend like a week or two, you know, trying to uh, be together with the community members and understand what is, what is really going on and what, what are the, you know, uh, you know, the knowledge, uh, you know, and understanding in the area and then trying to uh, ask the right question. So I, th I think I think this is very important to be aware uh, to make sure that we kind of like uh, have a meaningful collaboration and, and uh, you know, like interactive kind of um, communication. Thank you. Thanks, John. And Indita, did you hear that question? And Indita, you're muted. Uh, when we visited the Phil first time, uh, the children are quite shy and they uh, are not uh, actually, until they are familiar with us, uh, they uh, share nothing with us. And after uh, uh, one or two days, uh, they actually, when uh, trust built on us, they uh, had started to share their experience in the form of oral as well as written narratives. They also perform various uh, dance song on the uh, on uncertainty. And we have also recorded this. And lastly, uh, when they understand what we want uh, from them, uh, then we provide them uh, painting sheets for do anything to uh, express their uncertainty. Uh, these are the final outputs. Thank you, Anandita. Um, okay, um, Angelos, should I hand it? Yes, uh, we have two questions from the audience. The one comes from Andy Large and it's to Sojan and Mobin. Um, so it's as to whether and how mechanisms are emerging in the Salween Peace Park and Koira to meaningfully devolve decision-making to the lowest possible level, which is the communities themselves. So that's the first question about mechanisms uh, emerging that involving decision making. So I can see that Mobin has answered that partially from the perspective of Koira on the from, from the Bangladesh side. Okay. Yeah, I didn't see that part. Sorry. Should, should I reflect briefly on this part? Yes, please. Uh, thank you so much. So as I mentioned in one of uh, my like slides, um, uh, in the Southern Peace Park, we have a uh, Southern Peace Park governance uh, structure. And uh, the, the highest decision making platform form is called uh, Saloon Peace Park uh, General Assembly, where you have like community representative of communities members, and also representative of civil society, and uh, local current authorities. So, uh, but uh, in the General Assembly, there are more um, a community representative uh, sitting in the uh, decision making kind of uh, chair, so that um, so how these uh, these representative to be in the general assembly is that they have to uh, go uh, went through like a um, village level uh, election process. So uh, we also like in the in the Southern Peace Park charter, in the, we have a charter. 
we develop how it should be like uh, like uh, gender in, gender aspect is uh, like integrated in the process uh, you know the representative of uh, women and men and also um, how they have to conduct you know uh, these kind of uh, you know election in the village level and then uh, township level and then in in the in the central level in the general assembly to be representative in general assembly so this is how this is a kind of mechanism that can reflect our uh, village um, voices up to the decision making uh, kind of uh, level so I think this is a mechanism that we um, kind of uh, make sure uh, you know uh, you know decision makings are, are um, reflected uh, from the lowest possible to the up level thank you uh, thank you, John. Uh, moving to the next question. Uh, so Adrian is asking about, uh, it's for all speakers. So I think it would be a good opportunity to ask uh, uh, now to start first and we'll move to the next speakers. So is what would be some of the best ways to disseminate local knowledge beyond the communities and the hub? Do the communities you work with have any ideas about this? Would it help to have other communities, different parts of, the, of their countries or internationally hear and see their stories and react to them? Now we can start with you if you're listening to the question, which is also in the chat and we can move to another speaker. Okay, you're gonna do it. It's, sorry, it's, I think the internet is, Understandable. So sometime it just lost. I saw the question question in 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 the in the chat. Um, I I think it's um it's a better way. It's that not just um you know something uh, just for the for the knowledge disseminate beyond just the community and and the hub. It's that um you know we share um at different uh, platform. Uh, for example, you know, uh, in Vietnam, sometimes we we do like we organize um, the the photos uh, contest, and we talk about you know that's uh, in those photo contests. So it's make it like nationwide, and it's post on the the website uh, of all the related um, you know um, organization, uh, so people can have access to, and also um, you know sometimes we go through like uh, university, uh, for example, collaborated with local university and organize it. Uh, you know, bring bring those photos uh, and villagers to the university to organize the event there. So you know, uh, it's also as a way to to um, how to say like outreach uh, reach to youngest people like student in the university and they, you know, from there uh, through their um, student club uh, to also disseminate the information. Um, and so like different um, uh, organized um, events, exhibition at national level. So it's it's uh, something that that's helped to, to bring the, um, the knowledge outside the communities and not just, you know, and again, outside um, the projects. Um, so that's that um that that's something um, um and also you know you, you say like oh, the um, um you know the community work with have any uh, idea oh, they do because before um we go to uh, you know before we start any work right uh we, we have to work with them communicate with them discuss about the you know what they want to to do what they how they want to participate and what we want to you know call work together on the on the fighting so they do know about you know how we want to uh, to work on that and it's uh, one of the key thing that it's always for us um, that the you know like the the uh, gatekeeper like the safe uh, keeper of the communities people work um, so like again. Um, uh, they they know and they understand uh, the um, you know the potential like um, of how the knowledge uh, disseminations would would happen and then um, um, I mean it's um, it's it's in a way like like I say if we we organize uh, events at different part like outside the communities we have people from other places to join and 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 share the um what you know uh, the share the regions right and understand better understand uh, what's going on in the community um that's um 
yeah that that's um that's what we do yeah and um, yeah i think that's um based i want to add uh, one thing that the children of the sundarban uh, suggested to incorporation of uh, this traditional knowledge or indigenous knowledge as an optional subject in the higher school level and one who are interested can opt this subject in this way this knowledge can be disseminated Thank you very much, Nidida. So we have in the chat a response from Mobin. I'll read it out. Uh, currently, we're trying to figure out the best possible ways to disseminate uh, dis disseminate local knowledge beyond the communities and the hub. The community have suggested publishing articles in the newspaper, seeking help from the media, and using the internet in this regard. Uh, so, John, would you like to add something on that? About the um, yeah, I think I think. Um you know you know all all the description that we have i think we we've done all these things um yeah and i yeah i think i think podcasts also it's also a good uh media tool to kind of like um uh you know to produce uh to other you know audience because some people they might not have like a time to read so um they can listen to podcasts you know when they are driving or when they are you know on the way to somewhere or something you know i think like a, a short interview discussion podcast or news pocket uh can also be very powerful to reach to i think uh many decision makers they don't have time that much to read you know just listen to five minutes podcast discussion can be also very uh powerful i think thank you thank you very much uh there is a final question but i don't think we have the time to uh, answer that um uh, sorry catherine it was like a very important one and we'll have a chance to you know mail you later or even ask our presenters to look at it and give us other ideas about co-production, how different it is to collaboration. Um, so um, that was the end of the discussion. Now um, I'll pass the doors to Siobhan, who will uh, wrap up the discussion for today. Thank you. Okay, so um, first of all, thank you very much to all of our engaged audience members for joining the session today and yeah, asking such great questions and making comments and appreciation to our speakers in the chat. And of course, a huge thanks to our wonderful speakers for great insights and a thoughtful discussion, and hopefully the beginning of further discussions. I hope we can build on this, whether that's um, maybe a blog together or some kind of think piece based on some of the ideas that have come, shared ideas that have come out today. So thank you very much.